Yeah. People are drinking in the crowd. Yeah, they're giving out. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's the time, but it's not quite oh, a timer. timer. Oh, if you want, I can do like five, ten. Yeah. Well, no. I'm yeah, I'll reset on my right. intro. No, keep me, keep my intro is only supposed to be five. Oh, it's oh, gotcha. going to be up there. Yeah. I just want to make sure my intro stays at five minutes. Okay. It's up five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'll reset it. Everyone. It's Thursday. Last day. Thanks everyone for joining us at the third annual Coalesce. My name is Amada Echeverria, and I'm on the community team at DBT Labs. I'll be your host for today's session, how the content analytics team at Spotify avoids data indigestion in BigQuery with DBT. We'll be joined by Nick Baker, a senior analytics engineer, and Mitchell Silverman, a manager of analytics engineering. <laughs> Nick started his data journey attempting to automate finance and accounting functions at LuxTech, an LED lighting startup in Philadelphia. Now, Nick supports podcast analytics and builds tools to empower other analytics engineers to adopt DBT for their teams at Spotify. Nick's next concert is a Blood Orange concert at Brooklyn Steel. Mitchell kept it simple. His fun fact is that he has the greatest dog alive and there is no debate about it. I have a Pomeranian and I will fight you. <laughs> a few last notes before we jump in. All chat conversations and Q&A will take place in the Coalesce Avoiding Data Indigestion channel of DBT Slack. You know the drill by now. Connect, ask questions, and stay in tune with everyone joining from online. If you're not part of DBT Slack, you know, community.gettvt.com. See you there. Look for the channel and we'll all be together. So um, if you're already in, take a moment to say hi. Our chat champions, Eric Bauman, software engineer at DBT Labs, and Brian Pay, an analytics engineer at Spotify who's standing right in front of me, all posted icebreakers. Brian is cool. He has been in data for nine years, but it wasn't until DBT was introduced when he finally said, oh, I get it. After the session, the speakers will definitely be in Slack answering your questions. Connect with them there. You can also go up to them, obviously. Let's make some noise for Nick and Mitchell. Check. Thank you so much for that great introduction. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time to see our talk with all the great speakers here. Thank you to DBT Labs for hosting us. Thank you to everybody joining on the webcast, uh, especially our family and friends who have no idea what we're talking about but are super proud of us, and uh, we appreciate it. So uh, we're here to talk about how content analytics avoids data indigestion in BigQuery with DBT. So here's a little background on who we are and what we do. This one. So uh, Nick and I are part of the Content Strategy Insights and Analytics team, uh, shortened to SIA at Spotify. Uh, our team is compromised of data scientists, user researchers, and of course analytics engineers who are concerned with the data related to content consumption uh, on platform and how that you know, affects Spotify as a company. Um, this team's been around for six years. Uh, the analytics engineering practice has been around now for almost three years. And we adopted DBT as soon as I joined the company um, to try to help us out with pipelines and our complex DAGs and you know all the data you got, hopefully Spotify users in the crowd create for us. Our team is compromised of myself. Uh, I'm Mitchell, I manage the team. Uh, Nick, who you're gonna hear a lot from coming up. Um, our 
chat champion in the front row, Brian Pei, as well as Sydney, who's sitting in the front row as well as our associate AE. Uh, not pictured here and on paternity leave and possibly watching this talk uh, is the head of our team, Tim Leonard. Hope you're watching and uh, hope we do you proud. So today, uh, we're gonna, Nick's gonna walk you through uh, data analytics engineering at Spotify, um, kind of like what we do, uh, adopting DBT and some of the pain points we faced as well as the, some of the solutions we came up with in order to make our adoption you know, seamless and go with the tide. Uh, and then he's gonna talk about Waluigi, uh, which is our internal utils package uh, and something that has helped us immensely and allowed us to do our jobs. So from there, I'm gonna, Hand it over to Nick. Test. Great. OK. Uh, thanks, everyone. OK, so I'm imagining a lot of you are familiar with this. To start out, let's do a little bit of engagement, not too much. If you have ever used Spotify, please raise your hand. Fantastic. If you haven't, it'd be a lot cooler if you did. Um, if you've used Spotify in the last month, let's keep the hands up. Great. What about the last week? And what about the last day? Awesome, that's great, we love to see that, me too. Um, so basically, what I wanna say here is just, if you imagine all the people in this room that are using Spotify and you extrapolate that to the hundreds of millions of monthly active users that we have as a company, think about what you're streaming, all the songs you're listening to each day, that's all getting put into our into BigQuery, that's all the data that we're looking at every single day, especially on content, that's a lot of the work that we do. So what that accounts to is billions of rows and terabytes of data every single day, which is just a lot. So we want to be very clear that everything we're talking about here, we're dealing with a lot of volume. If you can imagine the kinds of impressions we have, imagine any of the other stuff that we have going on, it just gets bigger and bigger. So what do we do with that data? Within Spotify, we have 20,000 batch data pipelines over that, uh, defined in 1,000 separate repositories, managed by 300 separate teams every day. Uh, that's a lot, right? And that's to say that we have no centralized data team. Uh, the data organization at Spotify is distributed, uh, which is great in the sense that it allows us to move quickly, to be very flexible, uh, adaptable to different situations. But of course, as you can probably imagine, it creates additional overhead when you have uh, cross-team dependencies or cross-project dependencies. So how do we deal with all that, right? So the tools that we're actually using, we've been using BigQuery and the Google Cloud data suite for the past five, six years. Uh, with that meaning that BigQuery is our go-to warehouse. Uh, and historically, the analytics engineer at Spotify has leveraged an internal transformation tool that's built on top of Luigi and orchestrated in sticks. Uh, it plays, and it does much of what DBT does. It plays nicely with BigQuery. It also integrates with Backstage, which is our open source developer portal. For those who aren't familiar with sticks, it's essentially the tool that handles scheduling and orchestration at Spotify. We're also migrating to Flight, which call that out. Um, but it's what we've been using for, for a while now. Uh, what that means is that when the time is right, it's spinning up a Docker image on Kubernetes uh, and then running whatever workflow it is that we, that we want to run. And so that's handling scheduling and all that stuff. And then Luigi, hopefully a lot of you are familiar with it, uh, is a Python package that was originally developed by Spotify. It basically just uh, allows you to build DAGs, but it allows you to take workflows, define them as discrete tasks uh, with dependencies. So all of us using DBT are very familiar with DAGs. Luigi is something that did that just a long time ago in a, in a very different way. Uh, and then finally, there's Backstage. So Backstage, as I said, it's our open source developer portal. For the purposes of our talk today, we're going to focus on its utility to giving visibility into our data ecosystem. Uh, but there's a lot of cool stuff that Backstage does that we are not going to talk about here. So from a high level, uh, this is basically what, like very basically, basically what the data looks like for us. You've got stuff that is coming from Spotify that we're generating internally. Of course, you have external data that you know, everybody has that. Uh, and by one way or another, we ingest that into BigQuery, and then this is where we're focusing our, our efforts today. We've got all those different projects that I mentioned, you know, where we're running that internal transformation tool that are taking the data that's been put into BigQuery, transforming it, and then putting it back into BigQuery. And of course, you're ending up with cross dependencies between all of these different projects, right? All of that, like I said, wrapped around with sticks for orchestration and then visible through Backstage. So let's show you Backstage real quick. Uh, this is just a very, very simple example of a workflow in Backstage, which could be a single model or a set of models running together. You've got general information. Uh, there's also documentation that comes with this, a health report, status of, of scheduled jobs, that sort of thing. And this is what we see when we're running any of our transformations. This is sort of the go-to overview of a workflow at Spotify. Digging a little bit deeper, we've also got examples of instances. So if you have a single daily job scheduled, in this case for April 7, 2020, 
uh, you can see sort of what's happening as that's attempting to run. So this example uh, has got a bunch of permissions errors, which is always frustrating. You can obviously dig into the logs over there on the right side, see what the corresponding git commit is with that, and then ultimately this run was successful. So this is sort of how we have monitoring into our different workflows. It's also great for running backfills. So we have it set up so that if you ever need to run backfills, we're running data or transformations a single day at a time. So in order to actually schedule that and to run it, you can also do that through Backstage. And last but not least, very importantly, uh, it also gives us visibility into the upstream and downstream dependencies that we have on our workflows, regardless of if they're created by our team or our other teams. So this sort of helps us, again, understand what does our workflow depend on and what workflows depend on ours and allows also knowing ownership, being able to communicate with people if there are any issues. Very useful tool. We're not here to pitch Backstage. Uh, we might save that for a future talk. But to reiterate, it really is just the UI into our entire data ecosystem. OK, so we're here to talk about DBT, obviously, and to show you sort of where we are now. So here's how things look today. Uh, we're still, the most of the company is still using that internal transformation tool that's been the standard and continues to be the standard. But starting with our team and now spread to a handful of other teams, we've been able to adopt DBT and use it in production, which is fantastic. So getting there, first of all, I don't need to pitch DBT to this room. That would be ridiculous. I know we're all on board with it. It's great. Uh, but we had familiar transformation problems. We had you know, long queries and lack of layering. So if you look into the internal transformation tool, you're seeing subquery on subquery on subquery on sub, you know. Uh, and that's impossible to maintain. Also important to note that that internal tool required separate repositories for production for dev work. So that's just additional overhead and maintenance staff to deal with. And it's opaque. The average analytics engineer at Spotify doesn't really get to contribute to that tool and to make it better and to make it adapt to their specific needs, which is something that frustrates all of us. We all want to make our work more efficient, you know, make it easier, and not have to repeat ourselves too much. And then on top of that, we had some additional challenges. So as I mentioned, a lot of data, right? Uh, so we need to only run data one day at a time, obviously doing that incrementally. We needed to figure out how to integrate DBT with Backstage so that we could use that UI to actually coordinate and schedule run these runs. Uh, we also, and this is what I'm going to be spending the majority of the remainder of this talk on, is dealing with uh, mixed table structure. So we're going to talk about sort of old school BigQuery. Uh, and finally, and very importantly, managing dependencies across separate DBT projects. So to get there, we created a Docker container and cookie cutter template. So our team obviously had to go through trial and error, figure all this stuff out on our own, and then we needed to make it accessible for other teams. So we put together a template, which other teams can fork, and then basically it has pre-baked guidance to get connected into BigQuery and to CICD, uh, as well as all the backstage integrations. So that's importantly uh, the ability to parse out the manifest JSON that's produced by each run, uh, which basically allows us to connect and register the different endpoints of workflows that we have from our DBT projects or our tables and the workflows that run them within Backstage to give that visibility that we need. And also to uh, present documentation, that also is something you can see through Backstage, as well as that lineage information, which is so important for, for us and for other teams. On top of that, another thing to highlight is the DBT run command generator. So as, again, as you see through Backstage, we have to say, oh, I want to run a backfill for these days. I want to run, I'm scheduling a run for just this one day. We need to be able to feed that into our Docker images and only run those you know, specifically for what the workflows are that we've defined. So again, we're oftentimes using tags to choose which models selectively we want to use in each run, uh, rather than ever doing a single DBT run. If our team did that, it, would be, it wouldn't work. Uh, and then the last piece that, that we're going to talk about now is we created Waluigi which is our internal DBT utilities package. So obviously, I'm no good with design. Uh, I just ripped the Luigi logo and then added some uh, Google Slides word art to that. But this is Waluigi. It's obviously an homage to the original Luigi tool built at Spotify, uh, but we've you know, flipped it around a little bit. So to help visual visualize how these pieces fit together, uh, first of all, you've got this very simplified view. but Basically, we've got our base image, which is serving as that container template. Uh, it's got the instructions required to get DBT core installed, as well as the corresponding and important backstage integration. And then you've got Waluigi, right? This is a package. It's a DBT project with macros, tests. It's versioned, and it's maintained separately through Artifactory, which is what we use to maintain all of our internal packages at Spotify, um, which is just you know, to make things consistent with the way that other teams do development, especially managing their own internal packages. Makes it sort of fit in with everyone else. 
So what is Waluigi? Uh, classic package. We've got common macros that we use across the company. This is something to make things easy for everyone who's adopting DBT to kind of uh, skip ahead and take advantage of some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. Uh, so that's things about testing. We've got user-defined functions in there, obviously common SQL generators. And then importantly, we also include integration tests. So we're testing the assumptions we're making about the macros that we produce to make sure that the outputs are all what we would expect them to be, uh, as well as Test. All right, so uh, now I don't have to do weird things with my hands. Uh, all right, where was I? So testing the backstage integration, yes. So we're making sure that that stuff doesn't break. So we make assumptions about the manifest JSON output that is essential to making sure that uh, we're, we still have that visibility within Backstage and that the documentation gets registered, the dependencies, all those things. So that all gets tested within Waluigi. And then last, and what I'm going to spend the remainder of this talk on, is something called Git External Table, which is a collection of macros that we use to handle external dependencies. OK, so external dependencies. Uh, to be very clear about what I mean by this, it's not data that's out, it's not ingesting data outside of BigQuery into BigQuery. It's the data that we already have in BigQuery that has been uh, you know, probably transformed by some other team upstream of us. So these are all the upstream models that we're then pulling in to run our jobs or any job with DBT. I might say external dependencies. I might say external data. That's the only thing I'm talking about right now. So first, now we have to talk a little bit more about uh, some BigQuery history. At Spotify, we have a mixed bag of table structures. So the first is table sharding which, because we've been customers of BigQuery for so long, uh, pre-2018, I think, give or take, is around when this happened, it used to be that the only way to store a table in BigQuery was via table sharding. So table sharding is the practice of storing data in multiple tables using a naming prefix. So in this example here, you've got my cool table, uh, which is the naming prefix for that table. And then, of course, you've got each date represented by a suffix. So if I want to access data from the 20, 26th, I can do that and select from that specific table or 27th, 28th, et cetera. Um, and it's, again, it's treated like it's its own table. So because we've been using BigQuery for so long, the majority of the data that we have has that structure. Also, our internal transformation tool was developed before then. So it is built to ingest data in that format and also to output it in that same format. So like I said, the majority of the data looks like that for us. Then there's native partitioning, which is the only thing that I knew about before I started working at Spotify. Uh, basically the concept of only referencing, so if you want to access data from a, a natively partitioned table, you're using a where clause, right? So the partitioning is happening in the background. We don't need to worry about that for this talk. But it's a lot easier uh, or more relatable if you've used other warehouses to access data that way. So this has become Google's recommendation and kind of the, the go-to way to do things in BigQuery now. Uh, we would love to wave a magic wand and take our whole warehouse and convert it. But with all the different complex dependencies that we have for other use cases, as well as the internal transformation tool, which is still the primary one, it would be, it would be ridiculous, way above our pay grade. So as a result of that, Bo, it's still recommended by Google to adopt this methodology or to adopt this, uh, this structure. And so we've elected to have dbt output our tables in that format. So what that means now is that you've got a set, or the majority of tables at Spotify that are sharded like this, like the example above. And then all the ones that we're now writing with dbt, for the most part, with a few exceptions, are writing out as natively partitioned tables. So the important thing, it's mixed ecosystem. Also want to call out how we run those models. So for this given example, uh, as you can see in Backstage, I've said it's April 7, 2020. The actual dbt run command that we're feeding in is going to have this variable called partition run ID. So that is basically saying, what day's data are we running with this instance, right? Uh, and that's just to manage the fact that there's so much data that we have to deal with. Okay. Yeah, no, it's working. Uh, okay, so then when we want to run that data, so sure, we want to run the data for a single day's worth of data. Uh, we want to run our models for a single day's worth of data. But that doesn't mean that we only ever want to access a single day's worth of data upstream. So in some cases, we're going to need to pull in all partitions, all the dates that are on a table. In other cases, maybe we're doing some sort of three-day aggregation, so we need a range, a list of partitions or of dates that we want to pull in. We also have the classic case of give me the same data upstream for the day that I'm running now, which is the partition run ID. And then in cases for things like metadata, for example, 
we want to access the most recent data. We're operating under the assumption that over time that data is getting more accurate, so there's no reason to go back and access things from prior dates. Okay. So let's talk about how we do that. We have this git external table macro that we've created to handle those, those dependencies. This is a very, very simple one uh, in the case where we want to access all partitions. So what we do here is we have select, you know, insert your columns here. I'm just simplifying to star from Waluigi get external table, and we've set the table name to external sharded, which is saying what is the shape of that table, and then we set an operation. And so in this case, we're using all partitions, which is compiled simply as select star from my cool table with an asterisk at the end of it, which is a wild card within BigQuery. So that means anything that follows this prefix, give me all the data that's in there. So that works, we end up, it merges, and we're happy. Now, on the most common use case, we're only doing this for one day at a time. And when we do that, we want to use the partition run ID. So same deal, we're using get external table, setting it to the table name, and then the operation that we're choosing in this case being partition run ID, which as you recall is coming from the run command. The way that that gets compiled is it simply just appends the partition run ID to the end of the table name. And if the data is missing for one reason or another, it's going to kick us an error, which is fantastic. If the data is there, which is even better, uh, it'll, it'll run as expected and merge into the table. So we built operations to handle all of these cases and more. So you can basically, as an analytics engineer, as you're referencing the hundreds and hundreds of tables that we have upstream of, of our projects, you can say, oh, I only want to pull in this specific data, maybe one day's worth of data, three days' worth of data, and that helps performance, because again, we're dealing with uh, billions of rows, terabytes of data on daily just for streams. Think about everything else. So we've covered the majority of data in BigQuery at Spotify, which is great. As you recall, we're also writing out from dbt natively partition tables. And this is the goal, right? We want everybody to use dbt because we love dbt and it's a better tool. What that means is then we're going to have a bunch of complex dependencies across dbt projects that are always that are all outputting natively partition tables. So we need to adapt get external table to handle that. And again, for the same use cases, right? So we still, even though it's shaped a little bit differently, we still need to pull through either the full tables, which would just be nowhere clause, uh, partition list, partition run ID, most recent, and then we, of course, have others that I'm not showing here. So now I imagine that there are a handful of you that are wondering why we didn't use sources for our external data. We made that choice for a few reasons, one being that there are hundreds of upstream dependencies for us, and maintaining a YAML file for that is just cumbersome. It'd be kind of a bummer. Uh, writing, so also using get external table, we're writing key information into our config and ultimately into the manifest JSON that's getting put into backstage uh, that basically tells us for any given dbt run which table was read, how it was read, and which partition or partitions were used. Ultimately, we would have needed some sort of macro to get that, to select that operation anyway, so we would have had to develop something that allows for us to dynamically choose which strategy we want to use to be selective with our data. And if we had done that, we would have run into an issue. So in this example here, we've got a you know, source, and that's not the right syntax for source, but that's what I put in there. Uh, and then we're just saying, okay, where date equals to this macro partition run date, right? We're just going to say convert partition run ID into a date, uh, compile it, and run. So the compiled SQL, that looks pretty good, right? You've got select for my cool table where date equals 9-26-2022. If the data is there, fantastic. That model runs. We have no problem. On the other hand, though, uh, and this happens, as we all know, maybe that table hasn't been written yet, but the problem is that the SQL there is completely valid. So if I were to run that, I'm not getting any error. I'm just going to be processing zero rows, merging zero rows into my downstream tables. Of course, you can set tests for that, but it's easier to just bundle this all together with our external source handler. And then, like I said, if we have dbt projects that are writing out natively partitioned tables, we're going to start to see this all the time. And that's just risky. And we wanted to make this easier for other teams to adopt without saying, hey, but the legacy transform tool can handle this. So of course, we're going to go back to get external table. Uh, in this case, you can see the config is slightly shifted. We now have external native, which is just defining what the upstream table shape is. Uh, we're calling it my cool table once again. And then we're setting the operation to partition run ID, which means for September 26, only access to the data from my cool table of the same date. When we actually run that, first what happens is we're checking the BigQuery information schema, which is uh, incredibly useful, especially for this use case. So first we're going to go, we're going to hit the information schema. We're going to pull down a list of partitions or dates that have been populated, that have already been written. And then we're going to check that against our operation. 
So if we're running it for a partition run ID, we're just saying, OK, is this date in the list of dates that are valid? If it's a range of dates that we're checking, we iterate through, check all of those against the list. Uh, or if it's the most recent, recent yeah, the most recent date, it kind of goes backwards. And so it'll look at which partitions have already been written and pull the one that is most recent and then compile that into the model. So when it hits BigQuery, if it finds that the date that we need hasn't been written yet, it's going to kick us an error, which is fantastic. Sticks can then handle that. It'll back off. It'll retry up until the point that we have that run. And it's not going to write out any zero row tables. Uh, if, the models, if the data is there, then that's great. It's going to work exactly how we want it to. So we've got it so that the different operations can handle all these different, different versions as well for natively partitioned tables. And let's summarize Waluigi get external table. Yeah, cool. Uh, so first of all, it's accessing BigQuery data outside of our DBT project, regardless of table structure, whether it is sharded or natively partitioned. It allows us to be selective about the data that we need. We want to be very thoughtful about what we're pulling in, because as I've said, there's a lot. It's also got built-in checks to ensure that that upstream data exists in the first place, right? We don't want these silent errors, and we'd rather not waste time having to go figure out which one of our tables wrote an empty table. And then something that I'm not going into too much detail here for this talk, maybe a future talk, is about what it writes out to the manifest JSON. So that's really how we're getting everything integrated with the backstage, the dependency, the documentation, all the things that we need. And kind of the punchy thing here is that it's allowing us to have interdependent DBT projects. So to put it simply, if we did not have Waluigi at Spotify, we would wa a lot. So let's talk about how it's going. All right. Well, we've got over 50 different DBT projects at Spotify now that are leveraging Waluigi. That's kind of misleading because, of course, you've got a lot of proof of concept in there. You've got uh, curious engineers, curious analytics engineers, everybody who might be trying to just see what this thing can do. But we can say with confidence that we've got you know, between 10 and 15 projects that are writing our production tables and that we do have dependencies between those projects. So looking to the future, we need to be a little bit more thoughtful about what we want to develop. A lot of this has been reactionary, matching the tool that we already have, but we're really excited about what the potential might be. So developing and being a little bit more specific about having a roadmap. We also, it's not, we're not yet at the point where we have a good process for how other analytics engineers at Spotify can contribute to Waluigi. So we need to kind of get a, a workflow around that setup. Another piece is getting better documentation on how we've integrated the backstage. We think that there's a lot of power there. Uh, it would be useful for analytics engineers to also be able to contribute and help with that, but also just to expose that to the world. And then the goal at the end is to get to a point where we become Spotify's official data transformation tool, and we have DBT as the, you know, a key part of our modern analytics stack. So with that, we're done. <laughs>